Good afternoon. My name is Charles Jacobs. I'm president of Americans for Peace and Tolerance. Uh, in about two weeks from now, on Pesach, Passover, Jews will sit at the Seder table and sing from the Haggadah that in every generation they rise up to destroy us. This to commemorate our timeless struggle with anti-Semitism. America, it was hoped, would be the exception to Jewish history. Yet something seems to have gone terribly wrong for American Jews. Decades ago, a new anti-Semitism emerged, which took the form of demonizing the Jewish state. It began in the media, and then it moved to the campuses where it grew and festered over the years. That was the opening wedge. So decades later now, Jews who support Israel, and that's the vast majority of American Jews, are coming to be seen as many, by many, as supporters of an oppressive racist state. And as such, Jews are seen by many as unvirtuous people. And increasingly, increasingly, they are seen as deserving of contempt. And it's getting worse day by day. We're experiencing an alarming increase in violent anti-Semitism in our communities, expressed in physical blows against identifiable Jews on the streets of New York. And we have even now experienced in America the slaughter of Jews in our places of worship and businesses. These attacks are unprecedented in American history. What is going on? Anti-Semitism has an elastic quality. It transforms the Jews into the symbol of whatever a given society imagines are the most repulsive qualities. In the Christian area, we were the killers of Christ. In communist movements, we were the capitalist exploiters. For anti-communists, we were the most devoted of reds. Blood and soil nationalists and Nazis who revere racial purity cast the Jews as vermin and race polluters. And so today, and so today, when racism, colonialism, and apartheid are believed to be the most heinous of human sins, voila, it is the Jewish state that is the racist state, the colonialist, the apartheid state par excellence. But what's different today, and what's quite frightening, is that in our time, it seems like all the anti-Jewish ideas from each of the world's powerful civilizations have suddenly come together. It's a perfect storm. We can see four hateful winds bearing down on us, the racist right, the anti-Zionist left, the Islamists, and the radical black nationalists. Now, let me show you a bit of that last one. There's been a deluge of anti-Semitic attacks in Brooklyn over the last couple of weeks committed exclusively by members of the black community. It seemed like the Jewish um, people own all the buildings out here and they own everything and they're not sharing nothing. They own everything. They're, they're, they're coming over here, they're taking over, and but they're not renting it back to us. See, they're kicking us out. Love conquers all. They're controlling all the jobs, the economic growth, and the community. So you think the Jews here are not really American? They know it. So black people would have reason to attack Jews? I wouldn't say they have reason to, but it is understandable. So all of these forces, the left, the right, the Islamists, and the black radicals are coming to us, coming at us at once. Uh, take a visit to almost any Jewish institution, and you can sense that the Jewish community is living in a state of siege. When you and I grew up, my friends in America, we didn't need guards in front of Jewish buildings. Now we do. Today's discussion will explore the surge in anti Semitism in America and the seeming inability of the Jewish defense organizations, particularly the Anti Defamation League, to effectively respond. We are truly honored to have with us two prominent commentators on the political and cultural state of American Jewry, Jonathan Tobin and William Jacobson. What do these keen observers make of the situation faced by American Jewry? How do they explain the surge in Jew hatred? 
what can they tell us about the role and functioning of our Jewish defense organizations in responding to these challenges, and in particular, the functioning of the ADL? And finally, what do they think we can do? This webinar uh, right now has hundreds of people online. There were over 1,250 registrants. It is being recorded and it will be posted later. Um, we will go for an hour and some. You can type your questions into the Q&A and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Jonathan Tobin is the editor in chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, the JNS. He is a prolific writer. Every day, every day I get in my email box, my inbox, and you should too, uh, the JNS daily trove of articles. And there is almost daily a piece by Jonathan Tobin. And it is so good. Uh, and Jonathan, we're not letting you sign off from the webinar today until you tell us how you do that. Do you have a twin? Every day, Jonathan. Jonathan has been a contributor at National Review. He's been regularly published in the Jerusalem Post, the New York Post, and the Federalist. He served as the executive editor of Commentary Magazine, my favorite. Over the years, he has distinguished himself as one of the most eloquent and incisive pro-Israel voices in America. Professor William Jacobson is a scholar and much more. A graduate of Harvard Law School, he's a clinical professor of law and director of the Securities Law Clinic at, Clinic at Cornell University Law School. He's president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation, which focuses on the intersectional left. And for over a decade, He's run the widely respected pro-Israel law and politics website, Legal Insurrection. Bill Jacobson not only writes about radical campus movements, he actually sticks his hands in the fire. Uh, he just now created, by the way, I could name 10 things he's done. You should Google him and support him. Uh, he just now created a website where any parent or student can register and report the teaching of critical race theory in their schools. Critical race theory is deadly for Jews in America. Okay, let's begin. Jonathan, give us first your take on the external problem as you look across uh, America, the external problem Jews face. What do you see as the forces that have lined up against us? How do you explain how this happened? It seemed so short time ago that we were happy and content and prosperous and unworried kind of unworried. Uh, is this a new time for the Jews? How serious is this? Well, first, Charles, thanks so much uh, for that uh, lovely introduction and for having me on this webinar. And thanks to everybody for uh, logging in um, to listen to us today. I think you're absolutely right. We are in a time of crisis vis-a-vis -vis anti-Semitism in this country. Um, it's a time of crisis for anti-Semitism across the world. There is, a, as even the Obama State Department said a few years ago, there is a rising tide of anti-Semitism sweeping across the globe. It's different here in the United States, in some ways less virulent, but nevertheless deeply problematic. And um, you know why this is so, uh, the, uh, the great scholar Ruth Weiss, um, once said that anti-Semitism was the most successful ideology of the 20th century because it had morphed and latched itself on to every ideology, every toxic ideology of the, of the century, whether fascism, Nazism, communism, and then at the close of the century, Islamism. In the 21st century, we are seeing this again um, with not only uh, the continued struggle with Islamist, um, theology and Islamist uh, terrorism, but also of woke ideology, of uh, the rise of a new leftist way of looking at the world that is fundamentally illiberal and a challenge to the basics, the foundation of American Jewish security and success in this country. Um, I would say to, to take a global view of what is on one foot, what are our problems in the United States as Jews in, as we confront the problem of anti-Semitism, I would sum them up with two words. One is partisanship and the other is wokeism or critical race theory. What, what role does partisanship play in this? Well, 
as you aptly summed up, there are four major threats to American Jews right now coming from the anti-Semitic right, the uh, BDS movement, the anti-Israel movement, black anti-Semitism, and intersectional, um, in intersectional theory, which is linked into that in critical race theory. The trouble is we are living in the most hyper-partisan movement in American history and living, perhaps in living memory, perhaps in over a century. And as such, we have uh, a situation where American Jews who are overwhelmingly democratic um, have bought into this. And what they have done, and what this is a common failing really throughout the country, and that we are able to see the faults of our political opponents, but not of our political allies. So for many, if not most American Jews, they can focus uh, in uh, like a laser on right-wing anti-Semitism because it is linked to their political opponents, whether they believe it is about Trump or about Republicans. And they see that as the enemy. And they have no sight. They have no willingness nor ability to see the anti-Semitism coming from the other threats, which are in some ways not only as um, insidious, but far more better connected to the corridors of power. So we when we have incidents like uh, Representative uh, Ilhan Omar, the uh, Democrat from Minnesota, who tweets anti-Semitism, who along with her colleague Rashida Tlaib are the only two members of Congress who are open supporters of, uh, of BDS, an, an intrinsically anti-Semitic movement and who traffic in anti-Semitic tropes, it became impossible for much of the organized Jewish community to treat them with the same severity that they would have treated someone on the right, as we recently saw with Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Republican from Georgia, who was rightly criticized for her uh, trafficking in uh, QAnon conspiracy theories. She now says she has renounced them. So there was that problem. So partisanship has hampered our ability to think clearly about, about anti-Semitism. And the ADL is a perfect example of that because it, is now um, sort of uh, a, an in-kind contribution to the Democratic Party since the since Jonathan Greenblatt took over and replaced uh, Abe Foxman in 2015. Greenblatt is a former White House, a Democratic operative, a uh, member of the Clinton and Obama White Houses. Um, he is a relentless partisan. Um, there are so many examples. I'll just give you one. Um, in uh, the summer of 2018, when uh, President Trump announced the um, nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. Within seconds, Jonathan Greenblatt was on his Twitter account. And we talk about Trump having a tr have quick trigger finger on Twitter. Greenblatt is, is, is no slouch either. Within seconds of that announcement, he was announcing ADL's opposition to the nomination. This is before any of the accusations um, that were lodged against him about sexual harassment, before really any debate. It was just, he's a, he's a conservative, the ADL opposes him. This identification with of the ADL, which is, you know, of all the great national organizations we have, it's the one that still really has a job. You know, it, it has a job of monitoring and combating anti-Semitism. Uh, a lot of our organizations uh, kind of have outlived their usefulness. Um, the ADL has not, but it has abandoned its its brief to take a position that is always partisan, always looking to, uh, during the past four years, to link Trump to anti-Semitism, to connect dots, whether they were clear or not, and to demonize and to really approve of, of the use of, anti, of really anti-Semitic tropes towards people who were Greenblatt's political opponents and the opponents of the, some of the major liberal donors who uh, now fund the ADL. But there's, that's only one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is woke ideology itself and critical race theory. We cannot overemphasize the role that has played in this craze that has basically taken over um, the political, you know, the, the public town square in this country um, that has acted to create categories of people. It is, it is supposedly anti-racist, but it is fundamentally racist in the way it makes race the center of every conversation and categorizes groups of people, including Jews, 
in ways that make them mark them out as either oppressors or victims. And Jews fall in the, in the mindset of critical race theory and intersectional theory, fall into the oppressors, whether this is just or not, and it is unjust. And what has happened is that the, the, uh, the uh, mindset of critical race theory acts not merely to, um, fun, you know, to fuel cancel culture, to silence debate and public discourse. Um, the basic civil libertarian agenda of the American Jewish community, of the liberal American Jewish community. It has also acted as a permission slip for anti-Semitism, since it basically excuses the anti-Semitism of the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. of the far left, of the BDS movement, and treats those movements as basically unexceptional, whereas people who stand up for Israel are seen as part of this oppressor people who have white privilege and are examples of white fragility. And indeed the entire pro-Israel movement is categorized in this way. And why this is so problematic is that believers in these bogus, toxic theories have essentially taken over the organized Jewish world to a large extent. Um, today you speak of my columns in JNS. Today there is, I have a new column with an interview with David Bernstein who is the immediate past CEO of uh, the JCPA, the Jewish Council of Public, for Public Affairs, the umbrella group of all Jewish community relations councils in North America, and who, has, who is a man of the left, a dedicated liberal, but because of his opposition to critical race theory and to cancel culture, he now finds himself uh, as a consultant looking to fight against it. And the truth is there was no room in the organized Jewish world for people who are calling out these toxic theories, these yeah. permission slips for anti-Semitism. And you know, just to focus in on the ADL, the ADL is a supporter of critical race, critical race theory and critical race training. The irony is that it's not left enough for some of its young woker members. You know, the, the trouble with for Jonathan Greenblatt, you know, in the words of a, a young college student who, who told me once the trouble with being woke is that there's always a woker fish. There's always someone who can one up you. And that has happened to some extent the ADL as, as with uh, some of the uh, far left Jewish organizations like uh, J Street and Americans for Peace Now who are now replaced or that there's, there's thunder is stolen by openly anti-Israel, openly anti-Zionist, openly anti-Semitic quote unquote Jewish organizations. And thus to, to open our discussion of, of the failure of Jewish leadership Faced with these two critical problems, <clears throat> which armed us and our ability <clears throat> to fight anti Semitism, our leading monitor and defense group for anti Semitism finds itself squarely on the side of the partisans and the wokesters who are the main obstacle to fighting anti Semitism in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 Prescient and uh, and depressing. Prescient and depressing. Uh, let me let me turn to Bill. Uh, you know, I really I, I wondered how many people who are listening to this are totally in shock. Do they, does Bill does the American Jewish public actually know anything uh, deeply about the nature and extent of the kind of Jew hatred uh, that now exists in America? Do they even understand, let's say, what's happening on the campuses? So so maybe. Tell it. Do you want to add to anything yeah. Jonathan said? Do you agree? Would you like to tell us about the campuses, for example? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate this opportunity. <laughs> Jonathan made some phenomenal points, so I'm not going to try to repeat even a fraction of what he said, but I do think the focus on the campuses is extremely important. And I think it's been something, I don't know if it's too late, it might be but as somebody who has covered it almost daily since we started the website in 2008, I think that the, what we saw on the campuses has now moved into the broader culture uh, with the anti-Zionist, uh, anti-Semitic, um, far left movements, which have redefined uh, support for Israel as part of white supremacy, colonialism, et cetera. Uh, this didn't just happen. 
this year or last year. This has been developing. And uh, guess who has been basically absent from the campuses for the time I've been covering all this stuff? It's the single largest group devoted to fighting anti-Semitism in the United States. When I think about all the fights that we've participated in uh, on campuses over the last 13 years, and all the groups that have been involved, particularly in the last five years. Um, I can't remember ADL a single time mm -hmm. being involved, uh, advocating for Jewish students or for Zionist students. Uh, now, I can't swear that no place in the country did they ever do it. Uh, they're a behemoth, but I can tell you, I've never seen them. I've never seen them anywhere. They've been completely absent from the campuses. And the, the people who emerged from the campuses now are in the political culture and they are the ones we're facing. Jonathan referred to, to it as wokeism, however you want to define it, whatever you want to call it, it centers Jews vis-a-vis um, -vis Israel at the center of the evil empire in their minds that um, they go out of their ways frequently with the assistance of far left groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, and in the last couple of years, if not now, and a couple of the other offspring of Jewish Voice for Peace, as really the problem in the world. And there's a generation of students who have been taught that uh, anybody who supports Israel, which as you've mentioned in your intro, is the vast majority of American Jews, um, is part of the problem. And I think that's playing itself out. Um, talking about, and I, again, when I view ADL, and I'm not an ADL basher, I don't wake up every morning thinking about what criticism I can have, but I do follow Jonathan Greenblatt's Twitter account and the AD, to a lesser extent, the ADL Twitter account. And it is pretty aggressive left, it's pretty aggressive. I, I don't think they've necessarily crossed a legal line uh, in terms of partisanship, but there is no mistake whose side they have taken in the partisan divide in this country. Um, and there's been a very pernicious effect. And just a couple of things that have particularly, I've particularly noted about ADL over the years is that they um, have acted as a, uh, you know, both a, a sword and a shield on these issues. And, and George Soros is the perfect example. There is criticism of George Soros, which is anti-Semitic. There's no question about that. But not all criticism of George Soros is anti-Semitic. There are legitimate criticisms of his political program. But ADL has framed it in post after post, announcement after announcement, that any mention of George Soros in connection with political discourse is mm -hmm. de facto anti-Semitic. That's the sort of thing where they've weaponized it for a political cause. So, for example, George Soros's groups were the ones who funded various DAs. Uh, New York Times covered it, Politico covered it, a lot of mainstream outlets covered it. They had a specific program to put DAs in place and get them elected who would not enforce the laws. Um, that has been declared to be an ant, to point that out, has been declared to be anti Semitic. But that's a political proposition. Um, and there's event after event where they've done that. Um, they, um, their hate map, where they're trying to replicate the Southern Poverty Law Center, is now being used to deplatform groups from the internet. But it is a hate map that is skewed towards listing right of center groups on it. If you're anti abortion, there's a ch good chance you're going to be on there. And so, when I look at ADL, they're absent from the battle of our time. They do things which are clearly political in nature, even if they don't cross the legal line for a 501c3. And they contribute to the problem. Uh, for example, as Jonathan pointed out, how outrageous that the group devoted to opposing anti-Semitism, the $100 million a year group, okay, announces they're against a Supreme Court nominee. I mean, that is how deeply they've jumped into it. And I think you can trace it back to Jonathan Greenblatt taking over, I believe it was in 2015. Um, but he's been very successful from one point of view, 
their fundraising has almost doubled. I checked their 990s in preparation for this. ADL has gone from about 50 million to close to 100 million uh, in those five years. Um, his compensation, uh, and I emailed Amy ADL to ask him if I'm reading this correctly, um, it looks like his compensation has doubled over that time period. Uh, I might be double counting, and that's why I emailed them, said, this is what I'm seeing, but it looks like he's gone from 400 to 800,000. They never responded to me. Um, and so this is a very lucrative gig, whether it's 400 or 800. He's building an empire. It's an empire not devoted to anti-Semitism. It's an empire devoted to the broader left-wing social justice. And from my point of view, fighting anti-Semitism is essentially the, the fundraising hook that ADL has. Uh, but what they do is much more broadly political. What they do is much more opposition to people who are right of center. And in so doing, they've done a lot of damage because they've written off half the country or 49% of the country. And that's not healthy for people who were fighting anti-Semitism. And I really was astounded when I saw the numbers for ADL. If you can buy ADL and ADL Foundation for 2019, I believe they're in the $90 million range. And I assume it's higher now with what happened in 2020. And he's getting it from the, the tech giants. That's, that's the shift. He's getting it from the tech giants. And that hasn't shown up in their number, their public numbers yet, because that's all 2020. Right, right. The other thing uh, they do, before I turn it back to you, um, uh, they lie to the American people. Because if we've said that there are four winds of hatred against us, they want us to think one thing about this. In other words, when they did a threat assessment, um, they did it for a purpose, not, for, not objectively. They want us to think that the biggest problem comes from the right, right? And they also marginalize and minimize the threats that come from politically incorrect sources, like black nationalists, like Islamists, and like the left itself. And I think this is one of the biggest sins. Let, let me back up for a second and let, let's go a little philosophical. Now, most of the Jews in this country lean left. How are we going to explain to them? Because they, they don't get it. How are we going to explain to them this animus that is coming to us from the left, from, the, from the, their own political home? Um, what do we say to them? How did it happen that people who are uh, in favor of liberal things and who used to be pro-Jewish, and who used to be pro-Israel, and who, and who have um, an exfoliating number of genders in their pocket. How can they link up with people uh, who throw gays off roofs in Muslim countries? How can, what happened to the left that, that made it our grandfather, not our grandfather's left anymore? Well, I think the, um, the problem, Charles, is um, partly, it's about a changing of definitions, and it is um, something that I think many American Jews who are, as you say, um, they lean to the left, they identify as politically liberal, um, that liberalism has gotten away from them, and that indeed um, a lot of the driving force on the left is illiberal. And by that I mean it is against ideas about free and fair discourse. It is against ideas about individual rights because critical race theory throws individual rights out the window. You say, why do they link up with uh, these, these really um, uh, terrible uh, Islamist movements which are against uh, gays, against everything that American Jewish liberals believe in? Well, they don't see themselves as allied with them, but some of the groups that have taken over, the ideas that have taken over them uh, their, their main organizations are, are, are in the process of it and have silenced some. Uh, they have bought into both intersectional ideas and critical race theory. And in critical race theory, there are two kinds of people. As I said before, there are oppressors and there are victims. And um, the Islamists, even though they're throwing gays off the roofs in, 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 in Iran and in other Muslim countries, are seen as victims. They're seen as people of color. 
were oppressed by uh, white imperialists, among whom Jews and Israel are listed as the white imperialists. So that's, that, that's where it comes in. That's the toxic brew that is being taught in schools um, and that is, it has seeped its way into our public discourse. So what will uh, and that shock- American, American Jewish liberals need to understand yeah. that you know, during uh, the, uh, one of our presidential debates, Joe Biden talked about critical race training and Trump had banned critical race training mm-hmm. with something that the ADL opposed. He said, it's just sensitivity training. It's about, you know, about being nice to each other. No, white fragility, this, this uh, patent nostrum book of, uh, of myths about, uh, wh- about uh, whites being all racist and America being a fundamentally racist country. It's one thing to say that racism exists, but it's as if the New York Times 1619 Project, a a (laughs) farrago of falsehoods about American history has taken over American liberalism and American Jewish, liberal Jewish organizations with with these lies. And Jewish organizations are assigning books like like White Fragility to their staff and to their, their leaders, their lay leaders, and they are indoctrinating them in ideas that are not, you know, they're not merely, they're not merely anti-conservative, they're anti-liberal. They're anti the, they're opposed to the ideas that Jewish liberals, that the Jewish community has always not only embraced, but understood was the foundation of our security and our place in this country. That's what's wrong here. That's what the message that has to be conveyed to the grassroots, the real grassroots, not the astroturfing of grassroots as we see on on Twitter uh, with the the, uh, social media companies and the internet internet giants, the uh, Silicon Valley oligarchs that are now funding Jonathan Greenblatt. Um, This is against the Jewish, the interests of liberal Jews. This is not a right-wing argument. This is a liberal argument against what is going on. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting. You talked about this guy, this fellow, David Bernstein, had to leave the Jewish organization uh, in order to fight wokeism. This is really uh, uh, frightening. Um, Bill Jacobson, can you give us, let's get a little granular. Can you give us a sense of what it's like to be a Jewish student on campus this day? You're on campus. Um, what is it like if he has a problem, where does he go? I know Jonathan just wrote a piece about a fellow at Tufts who couldn't, who, who was not helped by the ADL, but by other groups. Um, Bill, what's it like for, for Jewish students on campus? Well, of course, it's going to vary from campus to campus, but I do think it's fairly common at what I would refer to as the elite campuses. The, you know, the ones in the top 50 US News and World Report, the ones that produce the journalists and produce the politicians in many uh, in the liberal world. Uh, for Jews to uh, not want to express anything, any support for Israel openly, uh, because if they invite a pro-Israel speaker, there's a fairly good likelihood that there's gonna be some disruption almost as a matter of routine. Um, that happens at Cornell when um, a uh, Israel Independence Day celebration, I think it was 2017, was disrupted by a die-in organized by uh, SJP. Um, and so what I hear is that while people, students are willing to uh, express their Jewishness as a religion, they are not willing to express openly their Zionism, their support for Israel. And I think that's the prevailing view. The institutional support they get varies from campus to campus and it varies from year to year. I think that uh, Hillel went through a time period when they were maybe trying to find themselves. How do we be open to all Jewish students on campus when some of them want us to be anti-Zionist and take over the building? And I think they're probably still sorting that, but some Hillel camp directors at campuses are extremely good. I've seen extremely good support for Jewish students on the Israel issue. Others I've heard less glowing reports on. Uh, So I think it's generally a a negative atmosphere and Jews are forced to segregate their public personas um, when it comes to Israel in order to not be harassed. I mean, if, if, and that's why ADL's absence is so glaring. 
And I've noticed in the chat, you know, is this an ADL bashing affair? Um, I'm just telling you what I'm seeing, okay? Um, and what I'm seeing is uh, one of the most divisive issues now being pushed on campuses. It was pushed to Tufts very heavily and it's spreading out across the country is the so-called deadly exchange program instituted initially by Jewish Voice for Peace and now picked up elsewhere, which blames American Jewish organizations, particularly ADL um, for police violence against blacks in the US because of uh, police sponsored trips to Israel, where the training has nothing to do with routine street policing, the sort of things that create violence. That centers ADL at an, on an issue which is being used against Jewish and pro-Israel students on campuses um, because it's an ADL program, which I support completely. I mean, that's something good that they do, um, but they're absent from defending students and getting involved on the campus politics um, even though it's their own program that is being used against Jewish students. So, you know, that's just a good example. I don't, uh, you know, when I think of ADL, I don't think of it with dislike or hatred or anything like that. I think of it, frankly, with sadness that it could have been so much more um, than it is now. And it has chosen the wrong path, which is the partisan path. Um, and it has chosen a, a leader who is extremely divisive for the Jewish community. So I think of ADL with sadness. I mean, this is the major, I don't know what the budgets are of all the Jewish organizations in the US, but I think you could probably add up dozens and dozens of organizations and still not reach ADL's $100 million budget. And what are we getting as a Jewish community for that amount of ca cash that is flowing to ADL. Well, what we're getting is partisan politics that writes off half the campus and ADL, and I can tell you someone who considers himself right of center, ADL is now at the forefront of internet deplatforming and internet censorship. That is something that is gonna really come back to haunt us. Um, they form partnership with groups. They form partnership with groups that are known for boycotting conservative personalities and attacking conservative advertisers. Uh, and you know, how much more partisan could you get than to team up with sleeping giants to try to get Facebook to uh, you know, purge hate groups because what happens, and we've seen it on campuses, of course, every, nobody wants hate speech, but then the definition expands. And guess what, on campuses supporting Israel by a significant portion of the activist students is considered hate speech. So I, I think ADL by uh, moving to the, by writing off half the country, by um, organizing itself at the forefront of internet censorship, I think is, is gonna do long-term damage to the fight against anti-Semitism. Let, uh, let me take a step back for a second. You mentioned Hillel's. Um, you know, Hillel's used to be the place where before before this war against the Jews started on the campuses, Hillel's were the place that you as a parent would want there to be on campus because Jewish boy meets Jewish girl, we light candles together. It's uh, it, it was a cultural place, and all of a sudden the war came, and uh, the people who ran Hillel's were for the most part not ready for war. I mean they were all they they morphed from it used to be older rabbis. Uh, more religious people to the kumbaya uh, social worker set. And these are not the people who fight wars. So they were like much of uh, the Jewish world, they were unprepared to do it. And from what I'm hearing, there are hundreds of Hillel bureaucrats across the country, most of them telling Jewish kids to be quiet and keep your head down, which is not what they need to be told. I know, I know some great ones, and as you said, there are great ones, but there's, that's a big problem. And they raise a lot of money telling parents they're fighting anti-Semitism. I don't see that, except in some cases. One more thing about the external enemies, and then we're gonna turn to uh, what we can do. So anybody here who's, uh, now we've got close to 800 people here. Anybody here can go on the web and find videos of American imams preaching hatred against the Jews, right here in America. 
Uh, how serious is this problem? And again, what has the Jewish establishment done about this? What is it thinking about it? Um, what is its strategy to deal with what is a religious-based, deeply held um, uh, Jew hatred, which must not be mentioned because it's politically incorrect? I can tell you in Boston, we've had the Islamic Society of Boston built the biggest mosque on the Eastern seaboard. We found out that they were funded by terrorists and terror-related people, that Yusuf Karadawi, the father of the Muslim, spiritual head of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, was on the board. We went to the ADL, and not just the ADL, to the Federation and the AJC and the JCRCs. They wouldn't do a thing. They wouldn't do a thing. They wouldn't even go to their Black uh, partners in, in all of the social justice work that we do and explain to them that these people are here to poach your flocks. These people, by the way, have black slaves over there. You might want to think about that. So they wouldn't do a thing about it. And here we are in the cradle of liberty. And now we've got uh, a, a radicalized Islamist center. Um, so, so is this just a repeat? Is this failure to deal with that, the same kind of failure that exists with uh, the Jewish groups, the establishment Jewish groups, the ADL, vis-a-vis -vis the left? There's none, there's none so blind who will not see. Um, that's a basic fact. Um, you may recall um, about a year and a half, a little less than a year and a half ago, at the end of 2019, there was, and I think it was referenced in the video that you showed us earlier, um, a rash of anti-Semitic attacks on uh, Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn and elsewhere in the greater New York area. The organized Jewish world was very slow to react. Eventually it did, but it, it was very, very slow to react, in part because you know, it, it doesn't really, it sees Orthodox Jews and, and you know, who are openly identified as right. It, you know, they're not part of the boards of local ADL chapters, let's be honest. Um, they're not Jews who look like them. Um, there's a certain prejudice there. And it's also because the people who were the perpetrators were not the preferred perpetrators of their narrative about anti-Semitism. Um, you, your, your experience with the, the mosque in Boston was the same there. It's, we don't wanna talk about that. And you know the irony is, is that groups like the ADL are very big about connecting dots, about trying to talk about dog whistles uh, to explain. I mean, somehow President Trump, the most pro-Israel, who, who was a flawed individual, a flawed leader in many ways, but who was also the most pro-Israel president we've ever had and who repeatedly condemned anti-Semitism, but he was always deemed to be the cause of anti-Semitism. Um, I think there was a partisan agenda there, but a complete unwillingness to connect very real dots when it comes to people like Louis Farrakhan, who has a huge following within the African-American community, who is an open hate monger, um, who continues to, you know, Trump is banned from Twitter, but, you know, Farrakhan, you know, uh, you, you, you know, they, they, they ban various, you know, uh, right-wing tracks on uh, books on, on Amazon, but you can still buy, and, you know, his ravings. Um, that's, that's part of the problem. They won't look at those people, just to circle back quickly, something that, that um, William brought up about the internet. Um, the push against hate on, on Facebook and Twitter started with the ADL and with their event where so actor Sasha Baron Cohen uh, condemned Facebook for allowing uh, Holocaust denial and uh, you know various far right wing groups on there. And at the time I wrote, well, this sounds very defensible. Who's for hate? Who who's against this? But the point is, it doesn't stop there. And indeed, the ADL is pushing this cancel culture, even as it finds itself at times the victim of cancel culture. You know, it's, it's the old joke about uh, the capitalist selling the communist the rope with which he'll hang him. That's the situation we have with ADL and with some of our liberal groups who are abandoning liberalism and who are abandoning the fight against the Jews. So uh, let, let's talk about leadership and failed leadership. I mean, we know from history the consequences of failed Jewish leadership all too well. You know, most Jews go about their lives raising families, paying the mortgage, earning a living, 
Uh, they depend on Jewish leaders to protect us. So if the, if the established leaders uh, are, are not doing what, they, what they're what supposed to do, if they don't look at what we've presented, and I think this is broadly accepted now, there are, it is a perfect storm. There are many, many sources of anti-Jewish hatred. Sorry, some of them are politically incorrect sources. If they're not going to do that, what, what are we going to do about this? Um, what are we going to do about the, uh, the tilt to the far left of so many reform rabbis of uh, not only our defense agencies, but the federations and the JCRCs? Um, we've, we've heard your examples of, of, how, this is, of how this is happening. Um, what, is it that, what is it that we can do? I, I've, um, I've spoken to Caroline Glick and Melanie Phillips, and they both say, look, uh, there's a million and a half Jews who think like we do in America, uh, but they're not organized in a way that presents an alternative platform to the establishment groups. And then there are many Jews on the right who don't, I got criticism from running the, from some Jews on the right, you know, you're washing our dirty laundry in public, we're a small besieged community, what are we doing? Uh, of course, this doesn't bother the left one bit, they're not restrained by any such fears. So. So, so what is it that we do? Um, we can continue to uh, build smaller groups around the country. I put some together myself. Um, we, can, we can hope for uh, the emergence of a charismatic young Jewish leader, boy or girl, man or woman, who can be the lightning rod to collect us all. What do you think we should be doing, given the problem? Well, I wish I had the answer to that. Uh, I think it's a cultural generational problem. I'm not sure that there's anything that can be done to change the culture at this point. I think that those who are inclined to uphold you know, traditional Judaism and support for Israel have to organize themselves and maybe not worry so much about converting, you know, left-wing Jews to the cause, because I think for so many of them, as Jonathan pointed out, being anti-Israel is part of wokeism. I mean, it, it, so it, there is a huge cultural phenomenon going on, which I think is probably irreversible. So I'm not sure the goal is to change that it's more to shore up um, our own defenses, if you want to call it that way, to shore up our, our own uh, groups, our own supporters. Uh, the one third of the Jewish community or 40% who does agree with us on these issues. Uh, I'm not sure the other, whatever the percentage is, 50 or 60% uh, is, you know, who've grown up on campuses uh, being taught this way, uh, I'm not sure what could be done. That's not to say nothing can be done, but I, I think saying we're gonna reverse this, I think is, you know, I'm not very optimistic about it. Yeah, you know, um, but shoring up, um, one of the things we've done is I've been trying to collect some of the smaller activist groups around the country. And we have collected 10 groups who, by the way, are part of the reason that this uh, audience is so big. I just want to name the groups so that people know there are groups like this and they should be organized together. The Rhode Island Coalition for Israel, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, the Michigan Jewish Action Committee, the Conference of Jewish Affairs in New York, the Israel Group, the Jewish American Affairs Committee of Indiana, the Russian Jewish Community Foundation here in New England, New Hampshire for Israel, and Z Street. So these are all small little groupings around the country. And we have worked with them to leverage our power. We've taken out ads in Jewish papers across the country and even in Commentary Magazine. So I agree though with William, I mean, that's not enough, but it needs to be done. And uh, I'm looking for a way to establish a platform 
who knows if it can be done, for the million and a million and a half Jews to openly challenge, to say, well, the Conference of Presidents is one thing, and the Federation is something else, but there's an awful lot of Jews who disagree with them and want these policies uh, pursued. It's, uh, it, I, I think we need to do that. I, I agree with William, there's no easy way to do that, but I think it's something that uh, should be a target. Jonathan. I, I think there are, um, you know, our, our response must be multidimensional. Um, I think it's great that the small groups that you just named, um, who are all great and do great things, uh, I think uh, they need to work together and I think they need to be supported. I think there are other groups, people like the ZOA, CAMERA, um, you know, we could go on and list uh, quite a few who do great things. Israel American Council um, has been a very strong uh, response to some of the failures of APAC and um, mainstream groups like the ADL. Um, those are very, that's an important response. But I, I want to sort of give us a more long range perspective. Let's take the long view. Now, in truth, when we look at this situation with an overwhelmingly liberal community, beset by partisanship, whose young people have been drenched in wokeism, um, there's good reason for pessimism. And indeed, you know, as, as it's hard to be optimistic when you see this correlation of forces. But I would ask all of those who are, are listening and watching to us right now to think back, not on ancient Jewish history, but on relatively recent Jewish history on the examples of, of things that happened in the second half of the, in the 20th century. Activism works. It works. It always starts small against impossible odds. The people who spoke up for rescue of European Jewry during World War II were Korshim, they were dissidents. They were pushed aside by the mainstream community who attempted to silence them. They were not silenced. They did not rescue all the Jews, but they rescued they rescued some. Their efforts did pay off and save lives. We speak now of the Soviet Jewry movement to move forward a couple of decades as a great Jewish success. And indeed, it was a great Jewish success. But the fact that there were a quarter of a million people on the mall in Washington in 1987, you know, to speak of that as being the Soviet Jewry movement, 15, 17 years before that, the only people who cared about that cause were a precious few dissidents, mm -hmm. outnumbered, dismissed. Are these two examples applicable to our own plight today or to our own problems today? Well, they're not exactly, nothing is analogous. History doesn't repeat itself exactly, except as satire. But they should inspire us to understand that no matter how great the odds against us, a few people working together, noisy, determined, at times even obnoxious because sometimes you have to be to speak up when it is unpopular. And that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. You know, if the essence of being Jewish, of Jewish identity over the centuries, over the millennia has always been to be willing to stand up against the idols of popular culture of the day. That was true for the Maccabees. It's true now for us today too because the popular idols, the, of, the idols of popular culture, of wokeism, of intersectional ideas. They're just as powerful as those of Hellenism. And just as, as hard as it is, you know, we send kids off to college in those campuses. You, you referenced the example at Tufts. There was a kid there in student government who wouldn't pipe down, who didn't listen to those, who said, you know, just, just keep your head down, you know, get through this. He spoke up and he, 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 he was abused for it. But in the end, with the help of, of some good organizations like the Brandeis Center, he was able to prevail against the odds. Now, will that happen in every situation? No, but we have to try. Every individual out there has the power to speak up in whatever circumstances they find them, themselves in. And I think the, the, the thing that we have to remember is as much as we have to arm ourselves and our children with the facts about Israel, with the facts about this, of the failures of, to fight against anti-Semitism, the one thing that Jews always need most when defending themselves and their people is courage, the courage to stand up. We still have that ability. 
we can show it. And when we do, yes, we'll take plenty of blows, but in the end, we can still prevail. Well, I, I certainly agree. Um, I, I do think there needs to be a greater national outcry from all of us on this side of the issue. I, I mean, I think it would be wonderful if we could get enough people together to declare a state of urgency for the Jewish community, because I really don't think that most Jews have any clue about how deep and how dangerous this is and how bad uh, the failure has been uh, on, the, on the part of our, of our leaders. Um, can we possibly, by pressuring the ADL, change them in any way? You don't, I think Bill Jacobson said, no chance. Is there any reason uh, other than educating the other people uh, to keep criticizing them and criticizing them? Are, will they take anything that we say for uh, deeply inside them? Yeah. I <laughs> I'll mean, <go. laughs> oh, okay, Bill. My comment, oh. my comment before was directed to this cultural change that I think um, is hard to fight, not necessarily to the ADL. I mean, I don't know them well enough. I just know their public personality. I know what they put out. I know what they put on the internet. I would hope that there are people there who will take to heart and seriously the criticism, not just on this panel, but we're not the only ones. I mean, there've been op-eds written about it. Mm -hmm. I know Jonathan has written about it. I, I, I would hope there are people there who will take it seriously because as I said, I think most people who criticize the ADL are not against the ADL. In fact, it's just the opposite. We wish it was what it could be, but it's not because it's taken a partisan tact. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, just a, another example, and these examples are important. Uh, when it was announced recently, not that long ago, that no charges would be brought against the policeman who shot Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, there was like a two or three hour press conference where not only the chief investigator, but the outside investigator that the city hired, someone has no connection to the city or the police force, went through in excruciating detail why it was a justified use of force and how the public narratives about him not being armed were false, all those things. What does ADL immediately do? They announce how disappointed they are that no charges were brought against the police. Did they not watch that two hour press conference? Did they not see the video recreations? Did they not see it? Why are they jumping into that issue? That's what I don't understand. And that's how they're damaging themselves. That's why they're taking themselves out. That's why they're saying to reasonable people who can look at this and say, look, I, don't, I wish the guy had not been shot. I mean, I wish he hadn't been shot too. But the evidence was so overwhelming by not just the police, but by the outside investigator hired to review this. How do you then announce that as an organization, you are disappointed that a policeman was not in effect falsely charged with a crime? Um, I don't understand it, but this is what they do all the time. This is what they're tweeting out all the time. And people are looking at this and saying, ADL is simply a Democrat organization um, which uses anti-Semitism as its cudgel to kick people off the internet and to align itself with political groups who oppose half the country. And I think this is just such a mistake. So my comment was not that ADL can't be changed, but my, my view is that they need to change. They really need to, for the good of the Jewish community, there need to be some adults in the room over there and not just look at fundraising and not turn itself into a generalized social justice organization because they are depriving the Jew of Jewish community of what once was the great defender of Jews in this country. Let me just jump in quickly on that. And that, is there hope for the ADL? Well, you know, money talks and the money they are raising is backing up Greenblatt's agenda um, it's coming from people who want it to be, you know, a Democratic Party um, auxiliary. So uh, thinking that's going to be overridden is probably foolish. 
but the hope for the ADL, and I, I echo what what uh, Bill said about you know that it we need to save it, not just we we want to save it. We don't want to destroy it. We wanted to return to what it was under Abe Foxman, with whom I had some disagreements, but also I, I spent a lot of time defending him because he understood what that organization's brief should be, and that the 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 hope is. It's because they're going to realize, even people like Greenblatt, some of their big funders, that within their organization and the pressures from without it, they're not going to be satisfied with just this sort of flaccid liberalism and uh, kowtowing to critical race theory um, that uh, Greenblatt represents. Uh, a group of ADL young staffers, you know, drenched in wokeism, criticized Greenblatt for being too pro-Israel recently, for not prioritizing more support for the Black Lives Matter movement and critical race theory. I mean, now I, I look at that and I think, you know, I think nuts. Um, but the truth is from their perspective, he isn't woke enough. Right. And the, if, if there is any hope is that there are going to be people within the ADL, um, whether currently in, as activists or old time activists or people who get involved with it, who can certainly join it and try and change it. I, I never, I, you know, I, I always say, you know, you, you don't like a big organization, join it. They're empty structures. They can be changed. All these groups can be changed. They're, they're, you know, it's, not the, it, it, it's, it's not a religious order. You can join and you can have an impact. But the point is, with the pressure from the left being so great, I mean, you may remember, remember a few a couple of a few years ago when um, there was an incident at a Starbucks in Philadelphia and uh, they were going to re-educate all of their employees about um, to, to not be racist. And ADL was going to be one of their anti-racism trainers because that's one of their side hustles. That's, that's part of how they make money as consultants for these things. And all of a sudden the Black Lives Matter movement and people on the left said, no, no, not ADL, it's pro-Israel. It's, it's clearly, you know, it's, it's trait. You know, it's not liberal enough for them and the ADL said, oh, yeah, you know, the, the ADL didn't push back very hard against that. And they were sort of dehired, you know, you know, taken down a notch by Starbucks. That happens often enough. And perhaps there are people within the ADL or people who will join the ADL who will draw the proper conclusions and bring them back to what they should be doing, which is fighting anti semitism Okay, wonderful. Let's take a few questions. Uh, before I begin, I wanted to not forget to thank two of my dear friends uh, for helping promote the webinar, uh, Sarah Stern of Emmett and uh, my good buddy Mort Klein of the ZOA. You should know that there's a huge fight in Boston. Uh, the, J the very, very left-wing uh, JCRC is wanting to push Mort Klein ZOA out of the big tent because he had the courage to say the truth about the failure of highest and about uh, Black Lives Matter's uh, anti-Semitism. So uh, we're in Boston here, all fighting to keep Mort inside. Um, it's a terrible thing. I mean, what would happen to a Jewish Community Relations Council that didn't have a Zionist voice? It would be terrible. Okay, some questions. Um, uh, at too many shuls, if I bring up the ADL, uh, it's an untouchable, uh, conversation. How can I possibly engage with uh, liberal Jews and express my criticism of the ADL? Um, anybody want to? Um, we live in a time right now where, you know, American, we're a bifurcated nation. Um, it's about politics. It's about everything. Um, people read, watch, listen, different media, if you're liberal or conservative. Um, you and Social media has exacerbated that tendency. We live in silos where we can, you know, defriend and delete anything that we see that contradicts our pre-existing prejudices and, and beliefs. And that's why we have lost the ability to listen and to talk to each other. But what I always say is that we have to try to relearn those abilities to listen. And yes, don't give up, talk to people, but talk to them in ways that do not attack them personally. Right. The goal is to persuade, not to beat them over the head. Um, that is the way, that is, you know, that is the normal mode of discourse right now in this country, where we see, both see each other, you know, left-wingers and right-wingers see each other as, as authoritarian threats to freedom. We've 
not only um, lost the ability to listen to each other, we don't credit each other with good motives. Yeah. Reach out to your liberal friends, relatives, congr fellow congregants, speak your truth. Yeah. Tell them, ask, try to make them think. Yeah, you I guess I would- Do it in a way that's not confrontational. Now and then you're gonna get somebody. You can at least open a dialogue with them about these issues, and that's what we need. I would say to that person uh, who doesn't want to hear any criticism of ADL because it's sacrosanct, I would say, you know, I'm very worried about all kinds of anti-Semitism, and I've seen this, and I've seen that, and I see the ADL is very good on the neo-Nazi white supremacists, but do they have a strategy for what's going on on campus? I'd like to hear more about that strategy. Um, I think that's an engaging way to do it. Another fellow, Ira, says, liberal Jews have hijacked the meeting of tikkun olam, distorted it, and made it a major tenet of the new brands of Judaism that posits how Jews are responsible to heal the world. So it's because, so Judaism is hijacked. Um, there's a great book on this. Uh, of course, you're referring to what I call the tikkunistas, um, people who have hijacked Judaism. There's a great book on this written by Jonathan Neumann, uh, how the Jewish left corrupts Judaism to heal the world, question mark. Um, next question. I was a senior member of Hadassah, I won't say in which city. Uh, we invited an ADL speaker to come. I wanted him to speak about the campuses. He refused. I got angry. He got angry. How can I start a ZOA group in Houston? Well, uh, Barbara, are you going to email me and I'm going to put you in direct contact with Mort Klein and you can do that. Um, okay, I think that we've had uh, a very interesting discussion. I think it's extremely important that so many people came to hear what's actually happening in the Jewish world and the, uh, and, and the problems that we have because we are, as you say, partisanly divided and because of the challenges of postmodernism or wokeism, and that this is the long, long battle that we must gear up for, but we've got to do it. We have no choice. We have to make sure that uh, Jewish life and, uh, and culture and civilization continues in America uh, protected. And so I would ask everyone uh, on the call to stay tuned. We are going to be having more, a series of these webinars with other speakers. We'll, of course, invite these two back for different topics. And let me leave it to you two to say uh, a final word. Well, Charles, thanks again for having me on. Uh, this was a great program. And uh, I would just say to everyone, um, don't despair. We have great problems but we are not without resources and we are not living in a time when Jews are powerless. We can speak up, we, are, and we do have the ability not merely to change minds as much as the odds may seem against us in, in, in the American Jewish world, but we have truth and the justice of Zionism, the justice of true liberalism, of true liberal ideas about um, America and about liberty um, these are our shield and these are our sword with which we can defend the values that made this country great, that enabled American Jewry to achieve what it has achieved and will allow future generations to go on. Um, I am a short-term pessimist, but a long-term optimist, both about the Jewish people and about America. And um, stay tuned and... Uh, uh, Log on to JNS.org every day and see what we have to say. I said I mean, you wouldn't be able to sign off until you told us the secret of how you produce stunning pieces almost every day. What do you do? How do you do that? Uh, it's, no, it's no secret, Charles. I just sit down and work. Um, I, as I say, that's what they're paying me to do. So I guess I better keep doing it. Um, uh, we don't run out of ideas. There is no shortage of uh, problems or issues to address. And I just try to sit down and do that uh, as well as I can every day. And I appreciate everybody who logs in to read, uh, to read us at jns.org and who reads me at other publications as well. So thank you to all of you okay. for reading. Uh, Bill Jacobson, give us a word about your last project now, which is so important. You found out that critical race theory, which is poison to America and double poison to the Jews, is now being taught 
all over, like mushrooms. It's just is spreading not only on the campuses, Bill, but in the high schools. Tell us what you're doing about that so we can help. Yeah, well, I'd also like to echo Jonathan's sentiment that uh, people should not give up hope that um, try to solve problems you can solve. Uh, don't worry about problems you can't solve. And there's a lot of individual efforts going on around the country. I mean, some of the, the best, bravest, greatest students I've ever met are the students who, when put into this difficult position of having the demand that they jettison their Zionism in order to be accepted, refuse to do so and really become heroic. And if you meet enough of those students, and there are plenty of them, it will give you inspiration and it will give you, you hope. Um, in terms of our project, so our main website is legalinsurrection.com. We are a 501c3 tax exempt organization, which also does research projects and other projects. And one of the projects that we've done is a website called criticalrace.org. And we uh, rolled that out in February. And it, it basically documents, not every school on there has mandatory critical race training, although a lot do. So it gives you a way to check. We have almost 300 universities listed now. You can see what's going on, some good, some bad. Uh, and we did that because we felt there was no resource for parents and students to understand what they were getting themselves into when they went to a particular college. So we decided we'll do the research. It's what we do, it's what we do best. We'll put it all together. It's an interactive map. You can hover over your state, click on your state, click on your school, and you can find out what activities are going on. Some schools, there's none. Other schools, there's a lot, and it's very, uh, frankly, abusive. So that's what we did, and that's uh, our website. It's had a tremendous response. And one of the things we heard back from people is when are you gonna do this for K through 12? Um, and so we're expanding our resources. We're not going to do a map for K through 12, but we just had a program about the K through 12 pro, uh, problem. We've got a resource page there, but this is an ideology, uh, as Jonathan pointed out, that centers uh, Jews at the vortex of, you know, colonialism, et cetera, a wokeism as enemy number one. And uh, they may not use that verbiage, but that's what they do. And so it's extremely important from a non-Jewish or non-denominational educational uh, viewpoint to understand what you're getting yourselves into. But it's particularly important for Jewish parents because that is the ideology that isolates Jews from the rest of the community. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, everybody should send you some money um, <laughs> along with the thanks. Um, if you want to get in touch with uh, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, go to peaceandandtolerance.org. Uh, this was the first in our series of uh, webinars on the problems that American Jewry faces, both externally and internally. And uh, please stay tuned. I, I want to echo the sentiments of our speakers and thank them again. Uh, this is a fight that Jews cannot and will not lose. We have no choice. We have to keep on going. At some point, we are going to be coming together and gaining more strength. There are a million and a half Jews out there who think like we do, and they're getting more and more educated by engaging in these kinds of programs. So I want to thank everybody and have a wonderful Pesach. Goodbye. <laughs>